Welcome to A Word from Our Outpost with Joseph and Crystal Gruber, a podcast for Catholic disciples who are wrestling to be missionary-minded in their normal, everyday lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Direct, O Lord, our actions by thy holy inspiration, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, that every word and work of ours may begin in thee, and by thee be happily ended. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to A Word from Our Outpost. I am the host, Joseph Gruber. So glad to be spending some time with you. Today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a passage that we had as our gospel on this past Sunday. And to unpack a little bit about its matrimonial import and how that helps us understand our relationship to both Christ and the world. So, to refresh your memory... The, the gospel reading from this past Sunday was from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17, and it might have ended at a couple of different places depending on which bracket the, the priest or the deacon decided to go with. Anyway, I'm going to focus much more on the, the rich young man. Uh, he's not qualified as young in this, uh, this rendition of the story in, in one of the other synoptic in one of the other synoptic gospels, he is uh, noted to be a young man, and that will play into to this reading as well. So I'm going to, to read the passage just to, to refresh your memory, and then I'm going to discuss a little bit about the matrimonial import of it, and then helps us how that helps us understand uh, both marriage and and also Christianity and and our Catholic faith. So that's the episode. I hope you enjoy it. So chapter 10, verse 17 onward. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have observed from my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. At that saying, his countenance fell, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So, the matrimonial import of this. I was reflecting upon this in prayer, and I realized what other scenario do we have in which one person lays down everything for the sake of the other? And, and that is what happens in marriage. Marriage is not just a contractual obligation of, I give you some amount of stuff for some amount of stuff, or this service for that service, or these goods for that service, or whatever. It is a complete and total gift of self and everything else. When I married my wife, Crystal, she received on our wedding day all of the books that I ever purchased and kept. She also received all of my debt, all of my student loans, and I received all of her books, all of her possessions. We, we both received fully and completely that which the other one had brought to the table. And I think that's really essential for understanding this story is that the, the offer here is it is matrimonial in some aspect. Now, obviously, this isn't to to sexualize the relationship between the rich young man and Christ, and that's made very clear because the money doesn't go to Christ, it goes to the poor. And with that, we have Christ's identification, his radical identification with the poorest of the poor. This is one of the themes of Mother Teresa's ministries with the Missionaries of Charity, is that in the poor, we will find Christ. Later on, um, well, I guess not in this gospel, but later on uh, in, in, in Matthew's gospel, we have the fact that Jesus is, is radically identifying himself with the poor, with those who are without food, who are without drink, who, who are without comfort. These are the people that he identifies with. And so for the rich young man to hand over everything to them is to give everything to Christ. And that is the only way to receive eternal life. The, the only way is through the, the spousal love that is being sublimated in, in this passage, 
that that this rich young man is being invited to. So, and and then the logic of this holds out, right? The the question is, how do I inherit eternal life? Which is a confusing question, because if somebody has eternal life, then how could you ever inherit it from them? Because they'll never die. We 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 receive an inheritance when the the person who has it and who is going to pass it on to us when they die. And so how do you inherit eternal life? So it's, it's a bit of a paradox, which is lovely because paradoxes have this element of being fruitful upon further um, looking into. But also it invites the question, well, how do I, how do I enter into some sort of inheritance scheme? Right? Like either, either I receive my parents' inheritance or I'm adopted and then I am due to receive the, the inheritance from those who adopted me. And the third way is through marriage. When I marry, then I also will receive whatever my spouse receives upon the, the demise of uh, her parents. And so that's, that's an interesting piece here. How do I inherit eternal life? My parents didn't have it. They, they either have died or will die. And so I know that I won't be getting it from them. I, I've checked all the, the natural progression boxes and all of my ancestors have, di- have died. So none of them have been able to give me eternal life. And so that leaves adoption and that leaves marriage. And Christ is not proposing adoption per se. He's, he's proposing the that he received the invitation of the bridegroom of bridegrooms of Christ himself. And that that will be the way to enter into an arrangement by which he is due all that Christ is due. Because he's the only one who has a father who has eternal life. And so he's the only one who can give the chance for eternal life to anyone else. Or rather like the, the legal ramifications of, of inheriting eternal life. And so the, the options that were left to the rich young man were adoption or marriage. And Christ is saying it is, it is a, an arrangement of love. It is an arrangement that is matrimonial in, in certain respects. And if it's matrimonial in certain respects, there are a couple of things to note then that Christ is promising a kind of conjugal fidelity to the rich young man. Like, if you go ahead with this, and if you follow me, that my will will be for your flourishing. My will will be for you to become the man that you are called to be. Now, there are prosperity gospel preachers out there who think that the best things possible all are in the the range of the pleasure and power dynamics of getting ahead and, and being satisfied. And that is not the full image of happiness that Christ has in mind when he's talking about being the kind of faithful spouse. So he has in mind the making of a saint, the making of someone who is so glorious alive, so gloriously alive, that whether suffering or sorrow enter their lives, that those who have united with him will still be joyful, that they will have ineradicable joy. And the rich young man walks away. He walks away from that offer. So, one, he is offering his own fidelity. He's also offering fruitfulness. And fruitfulness can be interpreted a couple of different ways. I remember one chaplain who was very into the, the spiritual fruits of that, that the Christian life is supposed to be fruitful and patience, peace, love, self-mastery, all these kinds of fruits of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's true. I think there's also a kind of spiritual fruitfulness that comes from sharing the good news with other people who then receive it and then become believers themselves. So I think if we understand the arrangement being offered as uh, an invitation into spousal love with Christ the bridegroom manifested through the self donative life offered to the poor, that that would be a life in which Christ is faithful and which our lives will be fruitful. 
So I think those are important things to note with this passage as far as the matrimonial aspect about who Christ is and what he has to offer and what the, the rich young man is, is turning down. Maybe another angle to look at this, when, when Christ is listing commandments, you know, you know the commandments, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. It's a weird list, right? It's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six commandments. One of them isn't even one of the top ten, the, the do not defraud. And they're in a random order. They're not in any kind of order that you would expect to see. And Christ is listing these in that order, probably for a reason. Very little, maybe, let's let's just go, let's push it a little bit. Nothing that Jesus says is without reason, because he is reason incarnate. And so he has th- this list of commandments, and this guy is saying, yeah, I, I follow these commandments. This random list that you rattled off, yes, that makes sense to me. And that's one of the, the tells here that he is following the rules without proper reason, that there is not this organizing principle. And this is one of the cool things both about marriage and about our relationship with Christ is that they, they sort of uh, impose or propose or give, maybe it would be the better word than either of those, they, they give a kind of ordering principle to one's life, right? Once I'm married, suddenly everything has to be seen in light of my spouse. When I commit my life to Christ, suddenly everything has to be seen in light of Christ. And so the ordering principle becomes manifest by engaging in the relationship. Note that the commandments that Jesus doesn't talk about are all of the commandments relating to God, to love the Lord your God, to have him alone as God, to honor the Sabbath, these kinds of things. He's not even mentioning because he is there to fulfill it. He is there to initiate a relationship with this rich young man. And this is one of the beautiful things that we're supposed to lean into in in marriage and one of the things that we're supposed to lean into in our Christian walk is the the allowing of the other to order our hearts. That on our own, we might follow a bunch of rules. They're not going to make as much sense until and unless there is another whom we love more than ourselves. And that is one of the beautiful things about marriage. That is one of the beautiful things about the Christian life. And that is what is being proposed. This random collection of commandments comes to completion when he gives over everything, hands it over to the poor, and then follows Christ. That's the that's the the invitation. And that's the I think this is a good way to approach the story. I think it is proper to see in this a kind of matrimonial uh, direction. Again, not a hypersexualized way, not even in a sexualized way, but in a sublimated, in a uh, spiritualized way, in which Christ, by identifying with the poor, is the recipient of all of the, the earthly goods of the rich young man. And then the rich young man can receive all of the spiritual goods that Christ has, that, that it actually takes a total, complete gift of self in order to receive the fullness of the gift of Christ. So that's what I have to say about that passage. I think it's a helpful way to, to shine light both on marriage and on Christianity and on our Catholic walk. So I hope you enjoy it. If you did, please rate and review this podcast. Please share it with someone else. Um, This is supposed to be the beginning of a conversation, not the end of a conversation. It might be fun to talk to other people about Are there other passages in Scripture, in the Gospels, when the words of Christ actually make more sense when we see them through a matrimonial lens? It might be helpful also to say uh, that the, the radical generosity that is being asked of the rich young man, how does that play into our lives right now? What kind of 
radical generosity are we called to right now? Obviously, the rich young man is given a, a way to instantiate that in his particular scenario, and the church doesn't say, hey, everybody, you have to sell everything right now and give everything to the poor. That is not what she says, but she does direct us to pay attention to this story. She does say, here, here is a Sunday. We want you to hear this story, and we want you to reflect upon it and see what it has to say about your life and your understanding of generosity and your understanding of the, the incredible invitation that Christ is making to each and every one of our souls. Because at all times and at every place, God draws close to man. He doesn't draw close to man merely to condemn. He doesn't draw close to man merely to, to observe. He draws close to man so that he might invite him to relationship with him. So you can talk to people about that too. Other things to note, uh, my wife and I, we run a marriage ministry. We added an events page to our website recently. You can check that out. Uh, Just put in a registration link because we're having a Catholic singles retreat day coming up in December. And if you're interested in that, you can check that out on the website. We also have a retreat day for husbands and for wives on November 2nd and then 9th in Michigan. So if you're within driving distance of that, we invite you to check it out. We also have a blog and, oh, we have another podcast. It's called Love Your Marriage. It's a short episode podcast, usually about 10 minutes each, uh, where we're talking about some basic ideas about living out uh, the Catholic sacrament of matrimony. And if you are Catholic and married, go ahead and give a listen to that. I'll put a link to all those things in the show notes. The other thing I want to note, if you are a Catholic married man, that is a Catholic husband, and if you would like 45 minutes with me, I would be delighted to serve you in that way. And you can find a link to sign up for time for that also in the show notes. So that's all I've got for this episode. Really glad you stuck with me this long because we're about to pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From our outpost to yours, thanks for listening. And a special thanks to John Mark Skoke. That's S-K-O-C-H. For the music. Check him out on Spotify.